So um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for attending today's uh, Spatial Analytics and Data Seminar uh, by uh, Professor Ate Portuis. Ate is an assistant professor of Big Data and Human Environment Systems at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at KU Leuven. His research explores the possibilities and limitations of big data through quantitative analysis and visualization. Today, Ate will be talking a little bit about his work on uh, improving pedagogy through the use of explorable notebooks, simulation, and games. So with that, please um, welcome Ate to the stage. Thank you, Levi, for that kind introduction. Um, let me see, just share my screen here. There we go. Perfect. Um, oh. So indeed, I will be, um, I'll be talking about pedagogy a little bit today, about exploration and, and play. Um, it's a little bit different maybe from the usual kind of empirical, uh, empirical talk. It's a little bit of an experiment, an exploration, uh, if you will. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty excited that you guys will be uh, more or less forced to, uh, to bear with me for the next uh, 45 minutes uh, or so. So what I'm going to talk about is this idea of of exploration of explorable notebooks. Uh, and before delving into that idea, um, I figured I should first explain this, this concept of explorable notebooks. And this term in and of itself is a little bit of a, a play or riff on the concept of explorable explanations, which was an idea coined originally by Brett Victor in 2011. Uh, and Brett Victor, for those of you who, who don't know um, him, he's, um, he's kind of a computer scientist, philosopher who, who thinks a lot about what we can do with human computer interaction in quite creative ways. So uh, I definitely um, uh, suggest you check out his website, worrydream.com for some of his ideas and his essays. This idea, explorable explanation, is really thinking about text um, as we know it in a, in a book, in a paper, uh, but also online, digital text and turning that normal text that normally is kind of a passive environment for consumption into really a active environment, an environment with which we can think. Um, and I think this is quite a, a powerful idea, uh, obviously has, has implications for education and pedagogy. Uh, and I'm certainly not the only one to, to think that. Uh, this idea of explorable explanations is definitely gaining traction. Here in the upper right corner, uh, you see an example of uh, Earth Primer, which is kind of an interactive um, uh, geography, geology textbook for secondary schools. Uh, there's also a website kind of collecting different types of these explorable explanations called explorables. Um, that is also very interesting and nice to, to check out. But if we think about this, this concept, this idea of kind of playful exploration and through that exploration, the production of knowledge, um, initially it seems like that's a, a, it's a very good fit for geography, or at least I like to think it would be a very good fit for geography. Um, but then when we think about how much of that playful exploration we do in our day-to-day -day education, in our day-to-day -day pedagogy. Um, I, when I think about my own education that I received in kind of the uh, early 2000s, there wasn't too much um, of that type of play, that type of exploration in the curriculum. In fact, when we try to think of examples, I think one of the clearest examples um, is SimCity. And I'm pretty confident that many people in the audience today at some point in their lives have played with, um, with this game. Uh, for me, this was growing up in the early 90s, uh, both SimCity and, and SimEarth as well uh, were really important games for me in, in exploring basically urban models and the idea behind some of these urban models uh, in a very intuitive, playful, manner. But of course, as uh, many people have pointed out, the assumptions and the models in, in a game like SimCity, um, they are lacking as well. Um, 
they don't include things like spatial inequality. Uh, they don't look at uh, structural racism and discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. They're very much simplified, very specific types of urban models. Nonetheless, if we look at education, uh, then SimCity is actually used quite frequently in urban planning, in urban geography, education, both at the secondary school level as well as at the, at the undergraduate um, level. And of course, uh, critiques of these models in a game like SimCity can be incorporated in education um, like that. It seems if you read some of these, these articles that you see here on the screen, and these are just some articles from, I think, the last about 15 years or so that evaluate the use of SimCity as a pedagogical tool, um, it seems that despite some limitations of this particular game, um, people see a lot of merit in the use of SimCity as a, as a teaching tool. And on one hand, that's great. Um, on the other hand, it's also kind of weird maybe to think about the fact that we're all geographers, uh, yet we use a, a commercial game to explain some of the core concepts uh, in, our, in our curriculum, in our discipline, in our field. Um, I'm seeing a similar uh, kind of pattern in non-digital games, uh, board games. Um, many board games today, I think, are also very popular uh, among geographers, among urban planners. Um, and if we think about these, these games, then yes, they're very enjoyable to, uh, to play, but the underlying concepts in, in many of these games, some of the ones that you see here, uh, often hark back to colonialism, to capitalism. And again, these are very popular games, uh, yet they don't necessarily include some of the spatial processes, spatial theories that we would really want to be teaching about in a geography classroom. So there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. On one hand, there's lots of potential with these kind of playful explorations of spatial concepts and spatial models. But the, on, on the other hand, the successful versions of, uh, of those explorations of those games in this case are often really um, anchored in the com commercial domain. And there's many different explanations that you could come up uh, with for this. I think one of the perhaps most important ones is that creating such content uh, like explorable explanations, it requires a lot of resources. It requires a lot of time, it requires skills. In the case of digital explorations, of course, it also requires in many cases, programming uh, knowledge and, and skills. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why we generally see quite low adoption in both education and research at the university level. Um, many of the examples uh, that we do find, like the two you see here, are kind of in the prototype or kind of smaller proof of concept stage, rather than, for example, an entire curriculum or an entire set of urban models. But I think there's a little bit more to this. Uh, and to understand that, for me, it's always interesting to look at history. Uh, so I want to do a, a very sort of short historical prelude. I won't go uh, too much in, into detail on this. Uh, Matsuk and I have, have written on, on this before. I think for me, the period of, let's call it spatial science or kind of this quantitative revolution in geography of the 1960s is in, in many ways quite um, inspirational. And one of the main reasons why I find this inspirational is that there is a lot of excitement and also, and there it is again, playfulness um, in the work that is produced in this, uh, in this particular period of time. Perhaps a nice visual example of this is um, Waldo Tobler's, uh, I think it's 1970 article in Economic Geography, um, where he posts this, this um, basically model of demographic growth uh, in, in Detroit. Um, and he also creates this, along with the, the kind of standard journal article, creates this computer movie, as he calls it. And you see it in the bottom right here. Um, um, Matt Wilson of the University of Kentucky posted this on YouTube a few years ago. So we actually have a, uh, a record of this movie. It will be a little difficult to see, I think, on your 
uh, on your screen, but I highly recommend kind of looking at it full screen and full resolution. Uh, basically looking at the evolution of population in Detroit from uh, the start of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century through right, a model of population growth. Now this excitement of the 1960s for a different way of thinking about geography, right? A way of kind of using models to think about spatial processes um, also has implications for teaching, of course, right? So we have a kind of a new way of, of thinking about geography. And then of course the question is, well, how do we, how do we teach this stuff? Um, and here I want to highlight the, the work by uh, Rex Walford, um, that took place primarily in the, in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, here uh, we see a book edited by him called New Directions in Geography uh, Teaching, where um, basically a bunch of people got together and really started thinking about, okay, we have all these new ideas in our discipline, in our academic discipline. How do we translate that to both an undergraduate curriculum, but also a secondary school curriculum? Um, and you can see here already in the introduction, uh, there are certainly some naysayers around that um, point in time. Um, but if you read the second paragraph of this introduction, there's also a lot of excitement. And that excitement about teaching these new ideas in geography, uh, at least for Rex Walford and, and many of his collaborators, translates into simulation uh, and simulation games. Uh, in, in geography. So for them, one of the key ways of explaining some of these new models, urban models, spatial models in the field is through this concept of simulation. And they produce all kinds of books. Uh, and in those books, and you can see here, the, the table of contents um, is it's game after game that is used to explain um, different geographic theories, different geographic models. Some of these, um, certainly today, we would think of in a, in a different light. Here's an example about coloni colonizing in Australia, really focused on um, kind of settling and mining, etc. And not that different from the board game Settlers of Catan, if, if you happen to know that game. Um, but these are really detailed, worked out games that can be played in most cases an undergraduate classroom. Uh, it's not only the game, but it's also about reflecting on the game itself and the results of the um, game. Most importantly, it is really the use of these models, as you can see here in this, in this quote from, the, from this book, it's the use of these models, the model building, the model operating, and the model evaluating um, that is so important to um, Rex Walton and, and his collaborators. So in a sense, it's not teaching about models, but it's really teaching with models, right? And the use of the model as a way to think through uh, certain spatial processes. So that's pretty uh, exciting uh, development that is taking place uh, primarily in the 1970s. Uh, we also see this in the kind of um, geography journals that focus on education. So if you look at the Journal of Geography in Higher Education or the Journal of Geography, uh, in the 1970s and in the early 1980s, then we see a lot of examples of this kind of game-like um, exploration of different um, uh, geographic concepts and theories. And then a little bit later, uh, we're talking about early 1980s, we see that initial exploration, that those initial simulation and games that are primarily analog, they're primarily offline, things that happen inside of a classroom on top of, on, on top of tables, tabletop, uh, move to the digital realm. I think this is a nice example from 1987 from Daniel Griffith, uh, thinking about how do we teach the concept of spatial autocorrelation um, through simulation. And he devises this kind of computer simulation where students have to uh, play with the data to reach certain levels of, of spatial autocorrelation. Um, what happens um, after this is a little bit of a 
a change and maybe that's a little bit of a, a mystery too so we see a lot of this excitement in the 1970s in the 1980s about um, simulation about kind of this playful approach to um, learning building knowledge um, in geography and then that seems to kind of peter out a little bit i think there there are many explanations for this uh possible um part is of course that there are disciplinary changes um there's certainly pushback against um spatial science um we we go through certain waves with the gis wars etc um, but i think also one very important change is that in contrast with the 1970s 1980s what we see happening in the 1990s is less of a focus on software development within academia, uh, but more of a focus on software development outside of academia um, by commercial organizations like, for example, uh, ESRI's uh, ARC GIS. And that certainly is also reflected in, for example, my undergraduate geography education in the early 2000s, um, where software development really did not um, have any place in the curriculum. Uh, and more importantly, there was still teaching about spatial models, urban models, but not really with urban or spatial models. So I think that sort of change um, happened in the 1990s and to a certain extent in the early 2000s as well. Now, I don't want to make this a, a pessimistic talk, but rather a, an optimistic talk, um, because certainly in the last few years, things are changing again. And this is something that I think in, in past uh, SAT seminars has been pointed out by many uh, different people. Uh, basically, what we're seeing is this really exciting resurgence of software development, but also the valuation of software development uh, in geography in the spatial sciences in, let's say, the last 10, uh, 10 or so years. Uh, here's two articles uh, that, that talk ab about this particular point, one by Jeff Boeing, uh, the other one by Sergio Ray. Um, not coincidentally, both of, of these people have, have given a, a, a SAT seminar, I think about a year ago, and especially Sergio Ray has talked about this importance of software development, right? the role of software development in, um, in the, the spatial sciences, in our discipline. So we see this change happening. And we see this specifically if we look at computational notebooks. I think this is really a, a rather fast change in, in our field. Uh, today, I think many of us are teaching with computational notebooks. We're doing research with computational notebooks. Part of our publications are based on computational notebooks. Quite a rapid change if you think about uh, the fact that Markdown, uh, which is at the basis of these, these computational notebooks, um, I think was originally developed in 2004. Um, so this is really a rather kind of sudden change, uh, but it's an exciting change because these computational notebooks, they are very powerful. Um, they really are an analytical platform that you can reason within. Um, and in many ways, they, they reach some of these initial goals of the explorable explanation. They are interactive. Uh, you can iterate on them. You can change some of the variables, the values uh, of the variables, and see how that affects your, your analysis in a very interactive fashion. Um, they're also, of course, transparent. They allow for reproduction. Many of these points have been made in the last few years. Um, importantly, they're very good at, at sharing knowledge, and not only the domain-specific knowledge, but also kind of the right what's behind the curtain how is a model actually computed but i do think they have a, a weaker point as well and that is that they're really powerful as a exploration tool for the author of the notebook right for the analyst who is actually writing or collaborating on the notebook but they're a little bit less powerful from the perspective of the reader in many cases the notebook is once it's done it is exported to either to PDF or to HTML, and that is done once, and then it's published. And that makes the notebook for the reader 
uh, in relative terms, much more static, right? Much more a platform for consumption rather than the platform for production, right? For knowledge production that it is for the author or the, the analyst. Um, so there, I think there's still something to be gained. So I would like to move from computational notebooks to explorable notebooks. And I think this is a, it's a nice example um, of where kind of where we, we have still a little bit of tension. Here we see an example of um, teaching regression by, by Sophie Hill. Um, and this is using in, uh, in the background, it's using the program language R, uh, but it's a web interface, right? So it's, it's quite interactive and, and explorable in, in many ways and allows students to kind of make a guess of the intercept and the slope here of the, the line of, of best fit. But what we see is when we change values, every time we have to click on that go button uh, to then reevaluate our new choice for the intercept and, and the slope. Every time that go button is pressed, basically what is happening is that the web browser will send a request to some server that is running R uh, that will then parse the intercept and the slope and, and then um, recalculate this. So this is there's always this round trip to the server, which makes uh, things relatively slow. Um, and it's not the type of interaction that we would ultimately want for, um, for exploration, for games, et cetera. Um, of course, um, there are, uh, there's lots of potential to go a little bit further here. So if we're going to move to explorable notebooks, I think one of the, the, the most um, obvious things perhaps is that we will have to embrace the browser. The browser is the environment that we all use today um, to explore new content um, without sort of any barriers. There's no need to install software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, computational notebooks or the end result of them, uh, they are often, most often consumed within the browser as well. But that does create certain challenges because once we move to the browser, we also kind of give up um, the traditional tools that we have available to us in spatial data science, um, in, in most cases being either Python or R. So we leave behind these really powerful spatial analysis and visualization languages. Um, and then we move to an environment where we have three different languages, um, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And we have to somehow learn these languages, but we also kind of lose the whole ecosystem that we have over the last 20 years built in both R and Python. So this poses a, a potential challenge. Of course, many people are working on, on meeting these challenges. I think one of the most exciting developments in this, in this vein is the, the advent of WebAssembly. Uh, now, I don't want to get too technical, but WebAssembly is basically a way um, to run different program programming languages, programming environments inside of the browser without the need to download any special software. Um, and already we have implementations for this for, for Jupyter Notebooks, uh, called Jupyter Lite. Uh, there is some initial work on doing the same thing for R called WebR. And what this means is that you can literally go to a website uh, and you can run Python or R inside of your browser without downloading anything, uh, you kind of immediately can do a certain analysis. And this is really um, what ultimately will be needed to bring these really powerful analytical environments inside of our browsers uh, without the need for a person who wants to explore a certain model, explore a certain notebook to download all kinds of dependencies and software. Um, Another example of this uh, that I think is very exciting is, is called AB Street, um, where uh, we can basically run an entire traffic simulation inside of the browser. Uh, here we make use of uh, Rust, uh, but again, it's kind of translated through this process of, of WebAssembly to run completely inside of your browser. So no need to, to download anything. Now, in some ways, these developments are still Kind of nascent. Um, there is still a lot of work to do before that becomes so mature that you can, without any concern, use it, for example, in an undergraduate curriculum. 
Um, so in the meantime, uh, perhaps we can talk about some other challenges that we have doing basically browser-based work um, in, uh, in the domain of spatial analysis. One of the, the key challenges, um, and I think many people have experienced a, a version of this, is doing visualization or cartography in the browser. Now in both Python and R, um, and as well as desktop software like ArcGIS or QGIS, we have really well established uh, tools for doing visualization, for doing cartography. In the browser, these exist as well. Uh, for example, we have d3.js, uh, for general visualizations, we have Leaflet, which is a really powerful mapping library. Uh, but both of these are um, kind of written for a much more general audience, for an audience of, of computer scientists, data scientists, data journalists, etc. cetera. Um, and they don't always work so well in a kind of traditional um, geography curriculum. Uh, for example, many of the universities that I have taught at in the last um, years, um, they have uh, perhaps an intro to cartography or GIS course focused on QGIS or ArcGIS. There's one or two spatial analysis courses that will either use R or Python. Um, and then you have perhaps one advanced cartography or interactive data visualization course. Um, if you were to dedicate this course to teaching a technology like D3, that's a really tall order. You might not actually meet many of the learning objectives that you might have for such a course inside of a geography curriculum. As a visual example of this, um, this is a book called Interactive Data Visualization for the Web, uh, written by Scott Murray. Um, it's actually quite a good, um, a, a well-written book, I would say. Uh, and it teaches you basically how to use D3, how to use this technology for visualization. It's about 300 pages long. Uh, and here's a screenshot of page 200, so two thirds in. Um, and two thirds in, uh, we're still making a very simple looking bar chart. Uh, and I think that's the big challenge here that these technologies, they're not written for geographers who want kind of results relatively fast because we have other learning objectives to, to deal with as well. So if you would build this into an undergraduate curriculum, you might only get right this bar chart at the end of your, your course. Um, so that might not be a, a good fit. Now, there is, again, folks who are working hard at, at changing this. Um, one example that I wanna uh, point out here is uh, Bartin.js. Um, uh, written, developed by a, a French cartographer, geographer called uh, Nicolas uh, Lambert. Um, also the folks behind Geoda are moving part of Geoda to the browser. So certainly kind of doing visualization and doing web mapping uh, is becoming easier for geographers. Um, we uh, developed our own um, approach to kind of answer this, uh, this challenge, right? So how do you fit um, visualization, interactive visualization and cartography browser-based in an, an undergraduate curriculum where you maybe don't have the leeway to do two or three advanced cartography courses. Um, so our answer to that is, is Florence. Uh, if you want to know more about the, this, uh, then we have recently published a, an article in, in Cartographic Perspectives, kind of outlining some of the underlying design principles uh, here. But basically the idea behind uh, our design of Florence is that we don't abstract away all these web technologies per se, but we ease the, the user, right, the learner into using these web technologies so that even if they ultimately wouldn't use this particular library for web making, the things, the concepts, the um, programming patterns that they have learned, they kind of translate to, to different approaches and to different libraries as well. Um, if you're interested, there is a, a documentation and kind of example uh, web page, um, but also uh, we have been using this particular library in an interactive data visualization course now for the last three years. Um, and this does seem to work uh, rather well. So here we basically have people with no um, 
prerequisites uh, with no previous programming experience in, in most cases, who go basically from learning how to program, learning how to use some of these web technologies like HTML and JavaScript, uh, to at the end of the, the course doing uh, relatively complex um, interactive mapping and, and um, visualization projects. And I think this shows the, the potential for geography education once we embrace kind of using and building uh, our own software that's, that's founded on the particular principles, right? The particular challenges that we like to and we want to address in our um, education. So that's one uh, prerequisite kind of tool around visualization. But then if we wanna go a step further and we really wanna go from these computational to these explorable notebooks, what might that look like? Um, just to point out some other work in this, uh, in this vein, I think the most uh, well-known one is absor observable.js, uh, which is really a, a, a platform for exploration, visual exploration of data. Um, another example is um, IDLE uh, by Jeffrey Hears Group at, at Washington uh, University. And again, these are made for, I think, in many cases, a particular audience that might not have the same kind of um, approach uh, philosophy as we might have in, in geography education. Um, so we have developed a, a kind of a similar approach that's maybe a little bit simplified uh, that you could see as enhanced markdown, um, taking a big cue from uh, both Jupyter Notebooks and uh, our markdown, but really bringing that to the browser and allowing people to write simple markdown, but then include interactive, uh, interactive content. Um, in the same way as people already used uh, to from R, from Python, but now bring that to the browser uh, and enabling that same process for JavaScript um, content for JavaScript computations. And why is this so important? It's so important because it basically removes the necessity for a server. Uh, so the whole infrastructure becomes simplified, um, but it also uh, enables this really fast interaction so we don't no longer need to every time we the user does something clicks on something send some signal to the server and then receive the the response back um, so this is really what ultimately uh, enables us to do very fast interactive explorations of of data of models as just one example of what that might look like um, here's some uh, work we did a while ago together with Dominic Power and, and Matt Zook on the geography of fashion, um, which, for which we used a social media data set, basically looking at the attention that is paid to different fashion brands, fashion people around the world and the differences, the geographic differences between, within that attention. Uh, but of course, the academic article, there can only be seven, eight figures. Uh, so you have to make some choices. But the data set behind that was really rich. So in this case, we decided to build a little sidecar uh, website uh, with the technology that I just uh, highlighted to you, allowing people to, to explore um, the data on their own. And again, uh, this doesn't need any expensive servers or complicated setup. It's just a set of static files, ultimately, that can be hosted on on any um, um, hosting, hosting provider. So to end my uh, talk, I want to look a little bit towards the, the future. I think there are three really exciting um, veins, uh, developments um, within this space, right? Within the space of uh, explorable notebooks, uh, simulation, and, and kind of this playful approach to, um, to geography. Um, the first is um, a recent development by the, uh, the folks behind our studio uh, that they've called Quarto, uh, which is really, uh, I think, an attempt to bring many of the um, developments in computational notebooks. Uh, we have them in, in R, uh, around R Markdown. We have them in Python, around Jupyter Notebook. But to bring those together in kind of one consolidated and, and cohesive interface, 
uh, that you can then have different backends and you could even have different backends within the very same notebook. So you can use a little bit of R and use a little bit of Python as you see fit. Uh, and I think this is a, a very nice platform to also integrate um, the backends that are needed for explorable notebooks. Uh, and then we're talking about kind of browser-based um, computation or evaluation. Um, so that's, I think, one really exciting um, venue. The other one is uh, bringing some of these concepts of exploration into existing um, spatial science curriculum. Here's just three examples. Uh, there are many more, uh, Danny Arabas bell Stefano de Sabata, and Henrique Tenkanen. Uh, they provide three examples of, of what I think is more and more common, folks using these kind of computational notebooks also as the basis of their, their teaching material, their lecture material. Now, in most cases, these are still relatively static environments for the reader, for the student. Um, here we see an example on the left from Stefano um, highlighting some R code and the result of that R code. Um, but very often what we do uh, is we, we give a, a little bit of this code, we say study this, and then we ask the student to do a version of that or some variation in their own environment. So the environment where we read about it and the environment where we actually engage with the code and play with the code, there are two different uh, things. On the right, uh, you see an example from my own uh, interactive data visualization course, where of course we're using JavaScript. So that is already possible within the browser where we can basically create little playgrounds, little sandboxes that immediately respond to the user's input. So if we change a variable, then in this case, the right side of the, the website is, is updated immediately. So bringing that to R and Python and slowly kind of making these all this great course curriculum that many people have been building, making exploration of that curriculum easier, uh, more accessible, and, and maybe a little bit more fun, um, I think is an exciting next step as well. But then ultimately to come back to simulation, um, that's where I see uh, perhaps the, the most exciting potential of this, this kind of new approach to computational or explorable notebooks. Um, there's a great example from um, some of our French colleague, colleagues called MAPS, um, where they worked with many people, dozens of, of French geographers together to build all kinds of um, urban and spatial models from an agent-based modeling approach. So sort of from a micro approach and they collected all of these models over the years on this, on this website that you see here. Uh, but if you look at it, there's a, an immense amount of work that went into this uh, yet to actually engage with the work. Uh, you have to kind of download the model and then in most cases download some very specific software to then run the model. Uh, so in, in many ways this work is uh, although it's amazing, it, it's not so easy to access it, and it's also not so easy to kind of play with it, to change the parameters, uh, to, to, to change the underlying assumptions. So coming back to kind of that history of using simulation, using games and geography in the 1970s, uh, that really gave birth to this, this commercial um, game, SimCity and, and others like it, um, I think one of the exciting um, promises here, both for education, but also for research, is to bring some of the urban and spatial models that we have today, that we teach about, and bring them in an environment that is somewhat like SimCity, uh, but where the user, the player, if you will, can change the specific urban model can change the underlying assumptions and the parameters uh, to then again become an environment, not just to kind of teach about these models, but also to really teach with these models in a playful, intuitive way. And I think with that, I will conclude. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, hear and engage with your, your questions. Wonderful, thank you very much, Ate. Um, so we have one question from the audience so far, but please, if, uh, as we're going through our discussion, more people want to ask questions, please do pop them in to the Q&A. Um, so I guess I'll get us started here with uh, Mikhail Toktakov's question. 
Um, thanks you for your presentation and uh, would like to ask if there are any difficulties when scaling up game like urban models, uh, such as the, the traffic example you had mentioned with AV Street. Is it better to use more generalized approaches like graph theory to roughly model these large and complex systems? I guess that would really depend on depend on the on the actual model, uh, and of course these are two equally valid uh, valid approaches. I think traditionally um, larger models have often gone for this kind of more top down uh, approach. But what we're seeing now is that the uh, agent based modeling computation is becoming, of course, more powerful. Is in many cases able to leverage, uh, for example, the GPU. Um, and I do think that enables uh, much interesting work that hasn't been done yet, right? So to come back to Chris Stoller here that we see in the top right, um, really modeling a, a central place system from a bottom up, right? From a micro approach, I think was very difficult to do um, in the 1980s. We see some very kind of crude rudimentary examples of that, but now we do have the computational power to, I think, sort of re-look at that work and, and re-engage with that uh, work as well. I, I think for me, at least, there is a, a, a very important advantage to this bottom-up um, modeling because it really allows us to also look at kind of alternative futures, right? Something that SimCity, I think, is also so powerful at. Um, and I think looking at the many challenges that we have today, climate change, uh, spatial inequality, I think in that sense, that can become a, a very powerful tool, both for education and for research. I see. I uh, would think that that answers uh, Mikhail's question. I think something that um, jumps out at me very clearly uh, from your talk is this distinction uh, between interactability and uh, play, right? That there's a lot of focus in the past couple of years, uh, sort of, which I guess I have been very complicit in writing a book that is interactable. Um, but the, the, there's a difference um, when you design a system for play versus designing a sort of a book for interaction. Um, we wrote geographic data science or, you know, Denny's uh, course on geographic data science uh, with the intent to have people interact with it, but there's actually no kind of structured environment in which people can play with things in those cases. So I wondered if you can reflect a little bit on sort of in your experience or your understanding of the concepts, how that interactivity might differ from notions of play in some of the examples you, you've discussed in the analog games uh, in the past. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good point. Uh, and I, I guess it's just a, it's kind of just a different approach, right? Uh, I like, that's why, for example, I like that um, uh, 1987 uh, article by, by Dan Griffith on spatial autocorrelation, um, where he is um, approaching the topic in many ways, very similar to what we do today, right? The, the students will have some small data set and then they will use some codes to calculate some kind of statistic that summarizes spatial autocorrelation. But there the, the approach is a little bit different in the sense that the student is then asked to kind of game the system and change the underlying data to kind of reach this, this perfect uh, positive or negative spatial autocorrelation. And I do think that's a, an approach um, that you see in, in that sort of 1970s type of, of work a lot more than perhaps what we're used to today. Um, I don't think that's, that's weird per se. I think that also partly comes maybe from, our, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but from my own education and what I um, was exposed to as a student. I think it also partly comes, and this is, comes back to software development here, um, where we now have kind of the possibility to really kind of creatively and freely think with our software again, because we kind of quote unquote own it again. Um, and I do think that opens up the, the doors here where previously that was a lot, lot more difficult. So, right, like in, in, in yeah. your example, there's really nothing that is standing in the way of taking a different approach to the exact same content and setting it up in a, a bit more of a, a playful exploration manner. Um, yeah. 
So why not, why not experiment with it a little bit more, right? Yeah, I know. I totally, I totally see what you're saying. I guess what, I, the, what I'm circling around is what's different, what makes a game different from having something that is explorable that you can change the code and execute. And I wonder if it's this element of having some kind of objective where like there's a, there's a score that you're trying to optimize, or maybe there's like an, an objective intrinsically to create something um, where I don't know if uh, the kind of interactability pedagogy has really hopped on that idea of, you know, creating systems where you're, the point of interaction isn't just to explore, but maybe it's to like literally play in some manner with, with a system, its rules and, and maybe an outcome of, of some kind. So I don't know, I found it really stimulating. I'm not sure it's exactly clear to me yet what the difference is, but I know that there is one. But that's a nice, I think that's a nice point, right? Because isn't that also part of why SimCity in the beginning uh, was, was received very sort of critically because there's no objective. Yes, right. But yet it, as a game, it became hugely, hugely popular. And in those, like some of the, the simulation and games books, people really talk about this too, right? Is that the, like some of the games have no objectives where others do, and sometimes the objectives then in the classroom, they get a little out of hand, right? Because people get overly competitive or enthusiastic about uh, reaching the objective and you have to pull people back to then reflect about, okay, what is it that we're actually doing again? Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if we always need, need objectives per se. I think that really depends on the, the pedagogical aim. Sure, yeah, I just wonder what it would be. So Rachel, did you want to cut in here? Yeah, this is great. I really enjoyed this. Um, hopefully my internet doesn't cut out and you can understand everything I'm saying. But I actually had a different reaction, maybe because I've been around longer, sadly. <laughs> but I wonder the extent to which, whether you're teaching with games or not now, we're teaching to a specific audience who are already interested. Whereas what was happening largely in the 70s and 80s was that this was to all students, arguably. I mean, if you look at Lloyd and Dickon and Location and Space, for example, this was a standard economic geography textbook, right? Uh, and that's not what happens now. I mean, whether it's economic geography, urban geography, population geography, there's this bifurcation that's occurred between, um, well, I would say the models have fallen out of favor almost wholly, right? We don't teach with models as much anymore anywhere arguably and then you know it's um yeah those who are not taking sort of a quantitative perspective on this are never really if they're exposed to the models central place theory is an excellent example basically it's a few slides that will say it's inaccurate it doesn't hold we now know this uh oh and one of these people may have been a nazi and that's it you'll move on to the next you'll move on to the next model whereas i mean i still teach this because I think that organizing space is a very fruitful way to think about, to think about the world, right? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I was curious just about how much pedagogy itself has changed and what this means for geography, because I would argue that we need the games and the models in all of the undergraduate courses, not just the explicitly spatial science or GI science courses. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Um maybe just two somewhat separate responses. I think um, Christoller, I, I like that example indeed because it always gets people kind of, uh, gets the blood flowing uh, for many people for different reasons. Um, but right, I, I think there's a reason that you're still teaching it and I'm still teaching it. I think there's there's many aspects of his, his approach that still, hold in today's world, right? There, and, and that's where models are so powerful, not just to kind of, right, talk about the model, but to explore spatial processes through the model and see where it does hold and where it doesn't hold. Uh, and of course, then that's a starting point for, for a conversation. Um, so yes, in, for, for geography, for spatial, specific, explicitly spatial topics, it almost seems like a natural fit. But in many ways, what you said about non sort of spatial theory or spatial models, 
I think other disciplines are maybe even a little bit further, right? We see this in, in both in urban planning and in kind of climate science, uh, where folks are really experimenting with kind of serious games um, at quite advanced uh, levels as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be spatial. Well, I, I suppose I'm just wondering what, do you see the pendulum swinging back to the point where models and games have a place sort of across the board in an in a undergraduate geographical curriculum? Or is this really going to become a niche thing where even if we do think more of interactivity in games, it's only really on, only going to be for the GI science and maybe cartography students? Well, I don't think it should be a niche, uh, but that's also why I think software development is so important because it's gonna remain a niche as long as it remains so difficult to create this type of, of content, right? So I think that yeah. is where we have um, some, some road still to, to go in, in making it much more accessible, much easier for colleagues, um, perhaps without much of an interest in, in programming to create these types of uh, explorations and, and games. Yeah, I know that we have another question. I just I'm going to get my last point in before we move away from me, which is that I wonder, as we start to have generational turnover, because you see this in, under, in childhood education under 18, that you get teachers who don't know how to teach things anymore. And we may have already reached the point where a lot of faculty, academic staff in geography would be unable, even if, even if we had all these tools at our fingertips, wouldn't actually be able to teach models anymore, right? Maybe, but then maybe we should, we should change that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back to you, that's, Levi. But that's, that's quite a pessimistic view. But it's true. I mean, if you look at like teaching grammar, for example, in American schools, you get teachers who, are, who aren't able to teach grammar because they weren't taught grammar when mm. they were students, right? And so it's not a, a lack of willingness. It's, it's simply a lack of, of exposure and understanding. And I, I suspect that we are largely there in, in many contexts. Who could teach central place theory? Yeah, I guess it depends also on the uh, geographic context, right? Like I think continental Europe might be a little bit different there too than, than kind of the, uh, the Anglophone um, universities, but yeah, sure, yeah. surely yeah. That, that's definitely an issue, yeah. Yeah, I, I think we'll get to the question for sure, but I, I also want to kind of possibly raise a positive that you know, gaming is now a big industry. So most people that you, most people that you're teaching have probably played some kind of computer game before. So I wonder if there is a way, you know, leveraging that kind of familiarity, although we might not any, more, any longer have kind of the models to teach, uh, maybe that's, you know, our pedagogical lift. I wonder. Um, we have one person in the audience raise their hand. There's, all, oh, sorry, there's also a, there's also a question in the Q and A from Gareth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll make sure to to hit that now. So um, Gareth wanted to ask: uh, in these sorts of games, and by extension, urban models and simulations, do you think that there is potential to program irrationality in such agent-based modeling? Uh, this could sort of act uh, counters uh, as the counter towards a gaming-based system. Um, where like, you know, uh, Gareth gives an example of city skylines was an easy game once you know kind of the systems involved and they're largely deterministic. So I wonder if you can uh, reflect on the ways in which uh, kind of uh, variance or, or lack of adherence to the model uh, can enter these kinds of uh, environments. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the kind of important pedagogical tools um, and also ways in which SimCity has been used, right? Is in, in playing it and asking students to kind of try to play out specific scenarios and then seeing how these scenarios play out, but also how the game allows, right? The gamer to, to play out this scenario. Um, very classic uh, example of both SimCity and City Skyline is that it's actually really difficult to uh, plan a city around alternative modes of transportation. Um, 
And this is maybe for a gamer frustrating, but in a, in a pedagogical context, it is a very interesting point to then reflect on how these notions, right, and our car dependency um, seeps into uh, many of the assumptions that we make about day-to-day uh, -day life. But that's where I think, right, doing this not as only a commercial uh, version, but a more educational version where you can actually change some of these assumptions and see the effect of changing those assumptions um, on right the development of your city or whatever is is actually extremely powerful yeah so i don't think we should kind of shy away from these uh assumptions and rationalities but actually play with them and embrace i mean that's ultimately what models are all about anyways indeed indeed there was a i think a rather famous uh, article that was published as well in simulation and gaming god maybe 10 years ago about the Kind of theory of history and science that's present in like the civilization games for example mm. and how that affects the way that people who play those games sort of accept these kinds of more whiggish notions of how science and progress in society works so i think there's a lot of interesting kind of area where you can bend those rules or examine the way the simulation is structured um, but anyway we're, we're running close to time um, i know it's, there's no more questions coming in through the chat here uh, but we probably would have time for one more if there's any going once. Okay. Um, I suppose in that case, then uh, we'll call it here. So thank you very much for attending today, everybody in the audience. Thank you very much, Ate, for giving such a wonderful and stimulating talk. Um, on... Thank you for hosting me. Yes, no problem. Anytime. <laughs> uh, and uh, as always, keep an eye out for um, the next events in the SAD series. I believe we have an uh, interview coming up fairly soon. Um, so we will let you know as you heard about uh, this talk, um, all future SAD events. So thank you very much and we hope to see you again. Goodbye everybody. Bye. Bye.